What's up? This is Rebel Radio. What up? What up? This is DJ Newmark. This is Peanut Butter Wolf. It's your boy. It's okay. Keep checking out Rebel Radio. Rebel Radio. This is Rebel Radio. We're in the place right here. Uh-huh. Rebel Radio is going down. What did you say? Rebel Radio? Oh, wait. Let's do it again. Rebel Radio. Today's interview with Richard Vision. If you're old enough, he's Richard Humpty Vision. Uh, this dude is a pioneer of house music since the 80s. He's going to tell us how he got started way back when in high school. And uh, he's been kind of a bridge between the house and pop worlds with over 40 number one Billboard cha- dance chart remixes. Working with everybody from Black Eyed Peas to Lady Gaga to Major Lazer. And he's had the longest running dance music mix show on radio uh, called Power Tools for over 20 years. So Richard is truly a house music pioneer. He's going to talk about how he's weathered the ups and downs and how he learned to manage his money. At the end of the interview, he's also going to introduce us to his new act, Wild Style, that he's producing. And this is going to be a two-parter. So today will be Richard Humpty Vision, Richard Vision, Next week will be Wild Style. And now let's get into the interview with Richard Vision. (laughs) But welcome to Rebel Radio. My guest today is Richard Vision. Hello. Hello. Hi. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I'm excited, and I've said this before, but I'll say it again. You know, we've known each other a long time, yep. off and on, but uh, it's been many years. Sound like a relationship. I guess so. <laughs> we were together back in the 90s, <laughs> and then we hadn't seen each other for about four or five years in the early 2000s. No, but I was telling Cassie, yeah. like, we, I think we met originally through Herb Magazine. Right, right. I remember coming to Power Tools in the 90s. Right. Because uh, we were like with Urban Power Tools, we we're yeah. like advertising. We we're doing yeah, like yeah, things yeah. together back yep. in the day, which was and, cool. Uh, so yeah, coming to the Florentine and right. you know, seeing that right. for the first time was a right. Was you, a I remember thing. you and Raymond Roker. You guys yeah. were like, "What sure. the fuck is going on here?" There's 1,500 kids. Oh my god! <laughs> That's what's a trip. Is yeah. you know you read about this stuff, but until you see it, right? You right. know, it's just a whole different thing. Right. And then, uh, and then you know, more recently, we we share. A close friend in in Dennis White, Static Revenger. There you go. Who was uh, the, our first guest on Rebel Radio? As he should be. Yeah, Absolutely. he's yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah. So and but is it Static Revenger or well, is it's it Latroit? Latroit. No. Latroit. No. Yeah. Yes. That's right. It's Latroit. We, His we, email even you gotta says have Latroit. a lot of no. aliases. Yeah. That's important. We learned that it's an important lesson <laughs> <laughs> to success in the music business. But you know, even so, I'm still learning things. That's what I was say. Even though we've known each other a long time, I'm still learning things. So I was doing my. My research, we do a lot of research here on Rebel Radio. Not always accurate. Right. <laughs> I found that's not important. <laughs> as long uh, as we have information, exactly. that's all that matters. Yeah, that's basically. That's the real world. I'm just reading this book right now that said, you know, I, I shouldn't give myself away on this, but uh, basically that if you just repeat stuff that's not true enough, then people will just believe oh, it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's the truth. Look at, uh, I mean, look at politics right now. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's the example. Yeah. Yeah. Just repeat things. Yeah, yeah. And people start it believing there. it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so anyway, what I learned about you is that in addition to being a radio legend, a, um, a uh, successful, noted remixer, producer, club DJ, but that uh, your first record was with The Movement. Yeah. Called was, Jump. Yeah, that was my first record. A record that I was—I must have played that out, and I—I I, I never even knew that was you. Ah. I guess I never watched the video because I watched it last night. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. And saw y'all on stage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they know. The girls yeah, know. Yeah, the girls oh, know. Oh, that's about cool. The movie. Yeah. That's my ringtone for him. Nice. Actually, you know, it's crazy, and I gotta send it to you. And I didn't send this to the girls, but uh, Destructo sent me the video from us and TJ where the roof started collapsing. Oh, shit. And that's the video that got us signed to Arista. Nice. I don't know how he came. He goes, bro, somebody sent me this on Facebook, and he forwarded it to me. Because he was playing there that day with Kool-Aid, yeah. and they didn't get. he was all pissed because they didn't get to play because the roof started coming down in the structure. Wow. Yeah. That's a trip. 
Yeah, so world. so for anybody that doesn't know, Jump is a is an early house classic. Yeah. Jump motherfucker jump. <laughs> was the, proud, uh, the so the proud of those version. lyrics. <laughs> hey man, dude, that it worked on the dance floor, didn't it? Yeah. I mean, you know honestly how we came up with that song? I I was DJing at the Palace that time, which is now called Avalon. Yeah. And um, my friends were a bunch, I had like 10 friends that were a bunch of idiots that when I started playing techno, of course. they would start jumping up and down. And um, and I was just like, all right. So one time, you know, because <laughs> my friends were idiots jumping up and down, I just got on the mic and I just started going, jump everybody, jump everybody, jump. And all of a sudden they got the whole club jumping. Wow. And when we went into the studio, to work on a song, I said, hey, I have this idea. We should do it like, uh, you know, I, I make people jump at the club. And that's how we we literally did the song, I kid you not, in like four hours. It was just, I mean, there's not a lot. If you listen to the song, it was like sure. eight tracks. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah sure. we didn't have a lot of technology back then. And we right. didn't know what the hell we were doing. And we found another guy, because I didn't like the way I sounded on the mic. So we found another guy to do it. And that was Hayes. And all of a sudden, we just put that record out. And and I used to slow down techno records. I used to play, you'll probably remember this. Oh, what was the record called? Give Me a Fat Beat by mm -hmm. Digital Boy. Yeah. And it'd go one, two, three, four, and it'd be a 45 record, and I'd slow it down to 33, and I thought that was cool. So that's why we slowed down the song. And then, I don't know, I was playing Boom Doon Doon at the time, and we sampled that, and we just kind of all crazy. put it together <laughs> and just kind of put it out, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm in Japan, I'm in Australia, I'm just touring the world. I'm like, wow, these records are easy. Music yeah. business is simple. <laughs> I do this for a living. This is easy. Yeah. And then we put out the second single and went, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> yeah, sure. That's the music business. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Oh, we're not on Arista anymore? Wow. Okay, cool. <laughs> but yeah. What's that like when you, when you're all of a sudden, I mean, you're a young guy and all of a sudden you're traveling around the world and like, it feels like, you know, the world is, is yours. Yeah, you know what? It's being, you know, growing up in like East LA and like, you know, not really doing much traveling and all of a sudden going to other countries as an artist is just, it's honestly, it's mind blowing. Like you're in Australia and we're doing an in-store and I'm like, an in-store? What the hell are we doing an in-store for? Like, I can't even comprehend. Right you know, what we're doing. And all of a sudden we're driving down and I see a line a block and a half long. I'm like, what are all these fuckers lining up for? <laughs> and the guys in the car is like, that's your in-store. Your yeah. record's like number 17 in the country. And I'm just like, what? That's so it's just, it was mind blowing seeing all these things traveling. Um, and at the time you can't really, you don't really understand it cuz I'm just I'm just a right. kid from East LA playing on the radio and you don't really understand how big a record is like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because there's not the internet to feel it. Mm -hmm. right? You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? There's yeah. not like in the internet you could go, "Oh, you know, my video has a million views so you can kind of feel it." Back right. then somebody just tells you, "Oh, it's a big record in Australia." You're like, so "Okay." Loved. You don't have you don't have people tweeting you. Right. You don't have right. you just go, "Okay, it's big in Australia." What the hell does that mean until you actually go? Right. Yeah. So, it seems it seems like either like the homies tell you right mm -hmm. you know or you, you walk down the street and you hear it coming out of a car yeah mm -hmm. or in a club or something but otherwise yeah. you don't know yeah so are you you know back in that time like are you able to kind of keep your head on straight or, or no nah, you, you're you know? not there's no way no there's no way you're keeping your head on straight it's just it's it's just impossible to be like you know in your early 20s and having success like that mm -hmm. and being a guy it's just impossible. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. So it's just impossible. What was it? Was there, what was the first like, uh, you know, extravagant purchase? Just like. When I got my first big check, I had, luckily my lawyer said, you need a business manager. And I was like, okay, what do I need one of those for? And I didn't understand. And so I got my first big publishing check and it blew my mind because I was driving a piece of shit Jetta. Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right, Beamer, we're gonna roll. <laughs> we're gonna do this. Yeah. You know, and I was still, yeah, was I still living? I was still in East LA when I got my big check. Mm -hmm. And my business manager said, um, I said, yeah, let's, I'm gonna go get a car. And she said, no, you're not gonna get a car. Right. And I said, what are you, what are you talking about? And she said, you're gonna go uh, put a down payment on a house. 
And I was like, I don't want a house. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of responsibility. <laughs> I want a car. I want to go to a strip club. You know, yeah. I want to, you know, I want to wow out. For and sure. she's, and my business manager said, look, if you're not going to listen to me, then I'm not going to work for you. And, wow. and I was the maddest person you'll ever know buying a house. Yeah. I was like mad. I told my friend that was working for me at the time, <laughs> like, yo, go find three houses I like. And, you know, I don't want to go look for houses. And I was like mad, literally buying it. Yeah. And my business manager told me, look, it, you don't understand the music business. There's peaks mm -hmm. and valleys. Right now you're in a peak and there's going to be valleys. And I'm making it so that if you quit the music business, you can go work at Ralph's and still afford your house. Yeah. And I tell people to this day, my house payment is $1,300. Wow. And yeah. it's not extravagant, but it's three bedrooms, it's a pool, yeah. it's a jacuzzi. It's, you did yeah. right. Yeah, it's the best thing ever. So I never, yeah. So and I was driving around, my, I was still driving around my piece of shit Jetta <laughs> with, the, with the Bondo <laughs> and you were so staying pissed. on the side. <laughs> and I had a house and I was mad. And I really didn't understand that for about three years Yeah. until I heat, I hit like a valley and I mm -hmm. went, oh shit, I get it. Mm -hmm. I get this now. Right. Yeah. yeah. What do you do when you hit that valley? Do you just continue working or oh, do yeah, you like yeah, reconsider yeah. Nah. working at Ralph's? No, 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 <laughs> never, never, never. You just, uh, you know, music business, I've just learned that you just, you just got to keep on staying focused and just dig your head in and just go, mm -hmm. right. you know, and you can't predict the music business, but I've just learned that if you stay focused and you do and you try to do really good music mm -hmm. that stuff will there's things that are going to pop that you just don't expect right yeah. and sure. that's what that's what's happened in my career that i've just learned so how'd you take us back to the beginning how'd you how'd you get started and what was your first dj gig oh my first dj gig i don't even my first dj gig was probably some house party on my block for my friends yeah um how'd you discover dj you know what? In my high school, is really crazy. At the time that I grew up in East LA, like in my high school alone, there was fifty DJs. Mm -hmm. Everybody had a crew. Yeah. Everybody in East LA was part of a DJ crew, mm -hmm. and that was just at my high school. And you times it times all the high school, and I think it was more of an East LA thing that was happening uh, in the late eighties and early nineties. That was just this real DJ explosion. So. It was just like, yo, come over to my house and we're gonna play some records after school. And you're like, all right, let's let's go. Like <laughs> it was just part of, right. it was just part of what everybody did. Right. It was nothing special. And then you'd be like, all right, well, I want to buy some records. I want to mm -hmm. learn how to do that. Yeah. And it, what, what really got me going was one time we'd all, cause nobody had money. So one kid had the turntables mm -hmm. and we'd all go over his right. house. And one kid would bring the mixer, but we'd set it up at his house and we'd take you know we'd have time slots to practice yeah and this one guy came in like i was mixing he's like yo you suck you're never gonna be any good let me get on he knew how to mix he's like get out of here blah 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 blah, blah. and he just kind of dissed me in front of my friends yeah so Damn. i rented I, I had some money saved up and i rented turntables and i put them in my garage and I literally practiced for three months because I wanted to prove this one guy wrong. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And we played at a house party together. It was a house party in Highland Park mm -hmm. with 36 speakers. Mm -hmm. There was this crew called Vanity that would bring massive, I mean, it was just ridiculous. And I remember playing right after him and my hand was shaking when I was putting the needle on because I was all fucking nervous, but mm -hmm. I held my own. I was almost as good as him. But, and this guy had like, he had been playing for four years. I didn't beat him that day, but right. I knew I was onto something. Right. And soon after that, I, I just, in my crew, I got better than the DJs at my school. And that's how I started getting some recognition. Where's that guy now? Uh, he still works in radio. Okay. Actually, yeah, 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 yeah. His, uh, Are his, you guys friends? Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. No, no, without a doubt. We're best friends after. Yeah, yeah we're oh, okay. really, really yeah, good yeah, friends. Sure. No, no, no. It was just No, but sometimes you need that kick in the ass. Yeah. Right? Oh yeah. No, yeah. no. It was it was a good kick in the ass. And yeah. then um and then my next break really started happening in high school. We had um there was like you know, you have president and vice president. Mm -hmm. Uh we had a we had dance commissioner. Mm -hmm. So I ran and became dance commissioner and somehow I convinced my school because I saw all these big parties that if the school gave me four thousand dollars, 
I could make them ten thousand dollars. Now, how yeah. they accepted it, I yeah, wrote it all cool. out in a proposal, and I don't know that's why yeah, that the, is amazing. the school accepted it. So I told them, like, I'm going to book up a recording artist. And they're like, a recording artist? And I explained to them the budget, and I showed them Casa Flyers, and I showed them all this stuff, and wow. they went for it. And so the first, uh, my first high school dance, uh, I had the Cover Girls perform there. And mm-hmm. the Cover Girls' first performance in L.A. was at my high school. Oh, my oh shit. So my high school dance sold out in like 20 minutes. The school made $10,000, and I was God on campus. <laughs> like, I can leave at any time. They let me do anything I wanted to do. It was the craziest thing. All the teachers were pissed off because I could walk. I'd be like in the middle of second period, yo, I got to leave. Uh, the right. principal will excuse me. I got to go take care of some flyer stuff. Yeah. And nobody could tell me anything. And 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 the second dance, this is kind of funny because it's kind of current now, I had World Class Wrecking Crew, oh, which was right before NWA. And if you've yeah. seen the movie, there's actually, they don't call themselves World Class Wrecking Crew, but uh, there's a scene where Dr. Dre is wearing a silver jacket, and that was them in oh, World yeah. Class Wrecking Crew. And their road manager that day that introduced them was Easy e mm-hmm. And this was at my high school. So that's therefore, wild. I was doing all, like at my high school, we had uh, JJ Fad. I had all these different artists, and that's how I got involved with radio, because radio wanted to be involved with my school dances. Oh wow. oh, wow. And that's how I got like an internship at KDAY, and then that led to my internship at Power 106. Nice. And that that's was awesome. what year? What a great story. This is like 90, 91. No, no, this is before that shit. This is like 88. This is 88. Wow. Yeah. Damn, my high school never did anything like that. That's cool. Yeah, they stopped doing dances like that like two years after. It was just. Why? That's awesome. Yeah. But I think it was the time. I remember, you know, at my school, like, we would have dances during lunch. Right. Just in the courtyard, dances. DJs. Yeah. yeah. What school did you go to? Well, I grew up in San Francisco. Okay, right. But there's a lot. There's like five big DJs that came from my high school. Right. Like all the kids on power. Now they moved to uh, whatever the new station is. Right. But like they were, uh, or on KMEL, like right. they, they all went to my high school. Right. And so at lunchtime we would have DJs and, you know, right. breakers and yeah. all that stuff. I mm-hmm. think it was just the time yeah. Yeah. when that was happening. Yeah. It was, it was a good, yeah, it was a good time. I mean, it was a good time to... Uh, uh, to be cre, I, I it was a good time because we didn't know what we didn't know what we were doing. Right. right, and there was no, and at that time there was no like I want to be this DJ traveling because there was no traveling DJs. Right. Mm-hmm. You either had right. a residency that was like the big mm-hmm. thing is to get yeah. a residency. Right. So we didn't know what the hell we we're doing. So you know, fast forward to when I put out my first record and I started traveling. I had nobody to call like, yo, hey, what should I be doing? Like, there's <laughs> right. just nobody to give me advice. Yeah. Right. Because it was kind of unheard of at that point in time. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, you know, back then, kind of mid-late 80s, we didn't have, there wasn't dance music as a genre. No. So no. what were you playing? Uh, I was playing, I was playing freestyle. Mm-hmm. I was playing Miami bass. And I was playing uh, what we call old disco, but a lot of people think of Bee Gees as old disco, but yeah. it was more like Lime, Transax, New Order, mm-hmm. uh, stuff like that. And I was gravitating to that. And it was right after high school, I dis- discovered my first house record, but I didn't know it was called House. And it was a song uh, by Adonis called No Way Back mm. that my friend, he was part of a record pool and we're going through his records. And I was just like, what is this? Don't, 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 don't. I go, can I have that record? And I had no idea what it was. Right. I just knew it was just infectious. Yeah. And fast forward, like about two years later, I got a flyer that said uh, Mayan New York DJ Frankie Bones. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, I want to go see what a New York DJ is. <laughs> Let's go see. So I went I went to go see Frankie Bones, and it just blew me away. He played four hours. I stood on the dance floor for the whole four hours, and I recognized three songs. And that was just like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. And I went to the record store the next day, and I said, on a Sunday, and they didn't have turntables. They had rented them out. It was a three-day weekend. And I said, do you have house music? And they're like, yeah. And he goes, um, I can't play you the records, but I'm going to give you four records. <laughs> uh, if you don't like them, you can bring them back. Oh, that's cool. And I said, all right. And he gave me uh, This Is Acid by Maurice Joshua. Mm-hmm. He gave me uh, Can You Feel It by Todd Terry. 
uh, I'll House You by the Jungle Brothers, and um, one of them by, uh, I can't remember, uh, Tyree Cooper or something from Chicago, a hip house record. And those four records, right then I went home and I mixed them back and forth in every way, and I was like, all right, I'm done with everything else. Mm. Like that just changed. It was just like, I'm done. And I remember I started buying all these techno records because I started realizing what techno was. Mm -hmm. And um, I had really nowhere to play them in the clubs. It was very hard. I could play a section of them. And it was this one time we were doing a club called, uh, it was my club on a Sunday night called Jumbo's Playhouse. And um, I told all my boys, I said, hey, man, I'm not playing I've Got the Power or any of this radio <laughs> stuff anymore. I'm not doing it. They're like, wow, what are you going to play? I said, I'm going to play all house and techno. And I cleared the floor. I mean, I cleared. <laughs> like, they stood for, like, the first 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. And after that, it just cleared. And literally, there was two people dancing. And slowly but surely, because I didn't relent. I didn't give in where, right. okay, here you go. Here, and let me play the radio right. song and right. get everybody going. Yeah. And they started coming back and they started mm-hmm. coming back. And within two weeks, it was a two-hour wait to get into our club wow. because yeah. we're the club on the East LA mm-hmm. that was playing music that you couldn't hear anywhere else. Yeah. So was that like, was that just confidence? Like you love the sound, so like I'm gonna play this. It was confidence. It was me being a little naive. Uh, yeah, it was more confident. I I just wanted to play something that I really believed in. And so wh- where does that come from? Because mm-hmm. I think you know. A lot of guys would would cave at that moment, yeah. right? Would would you know they need that validation right from the crowd, right, right, right to have so that. Yeah, you put that record on that you know is going to bring them back, even though maybe that's not what you want to play. I, you know what, I don't, I I don't know where it came from. It was just something that I just felt I had to do at the time. Yeah, you that's know, cool. it was just something as a DJ that I was just tired of playing records mm-hmm. that I felt all my friends were playing. Right. Like mm-hmm. it was just something I just wanted to play something different. How how competitive are you as a DJ? I mean, you talked about the kid, you know, starting out, but like has that driven you throughout mm-hmm. your career? Is is there a competition? Yeah, there's still a competition. Um put it this way, my I just did sound and I spent three days on my set mm-hmm. playing that sound because I wanted it to be exactly what I wanted to be. Um so I'm still, I still, I listen to other DJs. There's still, there's still, I think, a competition of, oh, that DJ did this. I want to do this, you know. A lot more of the competition now comes from the production side. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say, I say most DJs, but, I, and I think that's a problem because when you go hear a lot of DJs that are great producers, they're not necessarily great DJs. Sure. Mm-hmm. And they're set sometimes lacks or falls short of their production. Mm-hmm. Um, Why? Because they started, it, I was a DJ first and then I started producing. Mm-hmm. Today's route is you produce, get big, then you start DJing. Mm-hmm. Right. So before I produced my first record, I was DJing for five years right. every weekend. So. I had instincts from just, you know, just from doing it so many for so long, Mm -hmm. you know. And there's, don't get me wrong, there's some, like you take, well, no, if you go back to that, Layback Luke was a DJ first too. There's some DJs out there that are amazing on, that are great producers and and great DJs, like a Layback Luke really has skill. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, An Afrojack really has skill on the Mm -hmm. decks. There's, There's some of them that do really have some skills which is exciting because they're good producers and they're good djs are there djs that you watch now that you feel like you kind of you know look up to or that you look for you know somebody to do something new or do you feel like it's all been done no i i feel like things are are new again um just because I think people are moving away from the EDM, which I call songs that are by the numbers. Here's the breakdown. Here comes the drop. Here's the breakdown. Here comes the big buildup. Mm-hmm. And so I think um, DJs are now having to challenge themselves again. Mm-hmm. Like, can I play a record that doesn't have a breakdown and a drop? Can right. I play a right. record that just the kick just goes? And can mm-hmm. I keep the energy of the night 
and I think people are being challenged again to be creative, um, to to really figure out. Imagine if you told a DJ, you can't play one drop and play two hours. Mm -hmm. Mm. He's got to be able to keep. You got to be able to play music a that is gonna make people dance and still make people get excited. Mm -hmm. Right now, people are learned to be excited on the drop. Mm. Yeah. Back in the day, people were excited about the song mm -hmm. and how you brought in the song. And I think it's going back to that, mm -hmm. which is exciting. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think, you know, as watching the discussion about EDM you know, specifically and in and in the context of popular music right now, right? Like there's been so much hype, there's a lot of backlash, there's a lot of like, you know, there's er, everybody's got a, a prediction about right. what's happening with it. And I think, you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, this stuff just comes in cycles. Right. And, you know, you've had the benefit of a, of a career that's allowed you to see the peaks and valleys. Right. right. And know that this stuff kind of works out. Yeah, I mean, does. dance dance music never goes away. It just it just like in the early '90s, we had a big, uh, big commercial. I should say it wasn't as big as what we had now. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's it's usually it's usually four or five years uh, cycles. Um, I don't think anybody predicted, even I didn't predict this cycle was going to become pop music like mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. big pop music i didn't even see that i saw it becoming popular but i didn't see like you know five of the top 10 songs being four on the floor songs yeah um but with that being said i think um like hip-hop got to a point in the late 90s where it just became a little more bubblegum mm-hmm and people wanted something else. I think um, dance music on the radio has become a little more bubblegum because what has happened is, and this happened in the 90s, when an artist signs on to a major label, he therefore has to make a radio record mm -hmm. because they're not gonna take a song unless it's a radio record. And that's where the rub becomes because the songs that became pop, they weren't trying to make a pop record. Mm -hmm. Like right. like Afrojack wasn't <laughs> trying to make a pop record with Eva with Take Control. Mm -hmm. It was just a dope record that became big in the clubs that crossed over. Mm -hmm. The rub becomes, okay, I'm going to make a radio record. So then all of the stuff that has come out in the last year has been really safe. Mm -hmm. And the kids have gone, okay, this isn't the coolest thing in the world. And so mm -hmm. now you're starting to see the cool stuff now that's going to radio is the Diplo the the snake um you know that stuff because it's just interesting and they weren't trying to make pop records see right. the diplo's not trying to make a pop record uh snake's not trying to make a pop record it's just records that cross over on its own it's when you sign to the major and you try to make that pop record that's and i've done it i've done it mm -hmm. twice in my <laughs> career and it flopped both times yeah right. so that's where you're starting to see i think you're starting to see uh, you're going to see a decline of EDM four on the floor at radio over the next couple of years. Um, but you're going to start to see some some really cool underground stuff. And I guarantee you some of that underground stuff is going to pop. Sure. Because it's going to be so cool that the kids are going, this is the coolest mm -hmm. stuff. And it's going to rise and it's going to rise. And you're going to see a couple of cool things pop that way. So how do you, back to the question like how do you keep your head in the midst of mm -hmm. all of that right you said a couple times you get caught up yeah but like how I mean, do you stay you, focused as you a, just as learn a i mean you just learn you make you learn from your mistakes yeah. i mean what it comes down to you know I, I made a couple huge mistakes in my i did this one project uh called pure sugar it was the worst thing i'd ever did we had signed to geffen it was the absolute, it was me trying to make dance music for radio. Mm. Mm -hmm. It was the absolute worst thing that I've ever tried to do. Um, Why'd you do it? You know what? Yeah, a major label came and signed us off a cool record. We right. had this cool record called The Feeling yep. that that blew up. Right. I'd signed a, a, I signed a publishing deal and they're like, yo, major wants to put out this artist. And we're like, all right, let's do it all right, so all of a sudden we need something for radio. And you're mm -hmm. like, all right. You know, everybody in their head 
their ultimate goal is to be on the radio. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the ultimate goal. So sure. you're like, let's do it. Mm -hmm. Let's be on the radio. I'm going to be on a major label. Um, Did your gut tell you, like, maybe not to do it? No, not at the time. When I knew we had done something wrong is when I saw the video for the first single, <laughs> and there was like midgets and rainbows, <laughs> and I knew I sat. Videos don't lie. I sat there and went, "Oh my god, this is the mm -hmm. worst thing!" And at the same time, <laughs> at the same time, I was remixing. I kid you not, Cinderella for Disney Records that wanted to put out a dance album with Disney classics. Oh wow! And it's the most money. I can't even tell you how much oh I got for gosh. that remix. And right then I knew I jumped the shark. Right. And I was yeah. like, I need to reinvent myself. Yeah, how do you come back from that? Uh, you, you know shut what? everyone out and you're like, I'm out of here. I gotta like yeah. in my at hole At the same for... time, yeah, at the same time I'd just done uh I'd done a bootylicious by by it wasn't Beyonce. What were they before Beyonce? Yeah, Destiny's Child. Destiny's Child. <laughs> yeah. And I listened to everything I had done and I was like, This is complete crap. This is not cool. Yeah. So, so I went I went back and yeah. reinvented myself and said, okay, I got to start doing cool stuff again and do it for the dance floor. And, and I focus, every time I reset, I focus on the dance floor. Yeah. Because yeah. that's where you lose focus. Oh, I'm making a record for this. I'm making a record for that. Mm -hmm. And luckily now I've learned to separate the two. I've learned to make stuff that, you know, that is strictly for the dance floor and then I've learned to make stuff that is strictly for radio uh, for other artists. And I've mm -hmm. been very successful to be able to wear two hats to understand yeah. what works for what. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know. Yeah, that's interesting. I think there's a theme that's come up that, you know, the dance floor doesn't lie. Right. No, it doesn't. But I'm curious how it how it's changed over the years. How is, you know, what's different about walking into a room? You know, you said you played sound recently mm. right so what's different about that room from you know the florentine 20 years ago i mean it's a little bit i mean the difference is is like when we're doing florentine's the dome um that was my residency yeah. so you get people used to what you're playing they and come you to see you yeah they come to see you but they they're they're songs that aren't on the radio but they're hits in the club they're like mm -hmm. they, it's their record so um the difference is, is I mean, at the same time, you still got to keep them on the dance floor. You still got to keep the energy. I think walking into a sound is way more challenging than having a residency mm -hmm. where you're like comfortable and you know, mm -hmm. you know, I can play these, I can play these songs. But I mean, it's still just as exciting. Mm -hmm. It's still just as exciting playing. And especially I like sound because as I was telling you earlier, it's the first club that I feel is like a real club. Like the light guy will black it all out and it'll just be one light on. And it was stuff like that we used to do at the Dome. Mm -hmm. it, it's not set up for just bottle service. All the clubs right now are really set up for bottle service. Right. If, even if you go to an Avalon yeah. or if you go to, to uh, any of these major clubs, if you listen to the sound, it's not that loud. Mm -hmm. Because it's set up for bottle service. Mm -hmm. Their right. main goal is bottle service, keep those people comfortable. That's what Vegas is based on. Everybody's based on bottle service. And, you know, and that in part of and that's the reason why the DJ rates went up so high. Mm -hmm. You know, they kept on going up, so they had to get bottle service. So they all kind of work with each other. And I think sound is like the first club I've felt that is a cool club where the music is banging, but they're more based on what's happening on the dance floor and mm -hmm. I really like that. Interesting. Yeah, at least that's my take on it. Yeah. Mm. Nice. And so uh you may not remember this but you know I had the opportunity to book you for a party once. Um 2000 probably at Dominic's. Dominic's Wait, is that a club in it's LA? That restaurant on Beverly right next to Jerry's or next to Jerry's, Jerry's Deli used to be. it was like a Grammy thing we did I think it was a friends and family party maybe yeah I yeah. mean yeah. It, it did you give blurred. me free food probably <laughs> I think we paid a very small amount um, <laughs> but you know I remember that because you know I had seen you play at you know big rooms right and you kind of do your thing and you have a very like you play you know pretty high energy right and this was a you know small room 
in a restaurant, you know, industry crowd, not really that. And not Size. that I was nervous. I sucked. No, you know, what was amazing is, first of all, you didn't play house music. You played like old school, um, Shit. you know, probably some disco right. and, and that kind of, like, I remember it being different. Right. And I just never, I had never seen anybody mix like you, like as fast, like you drop right. into a record faster than anyone I'd ever seen. Yeah. Um, we used to be we used to be quick on vinyl. It used to be yeah. that was that was the exciting thing about vinyl is being quick. Mm. I mean, and I tell and I tell people the only they're like, well, how did you learn how to mix so fast? And it came down to because there's so many DJs at my high school. We did house parties. You had a ten minute set. Yeah, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. Ten minutes. So it was either ten minutes I'm gonna play three <laughs> records or ten minutes I'm gonna play ten records. Yeah, figure it out. And that's yeah. the only reason why I started mixing quick and aggressive was just because i had like a 10 and i got used to that and then as you got bigger you got 20 minutes Ooh, 20 minutes yeah. <laughs> but um yeah i kept i kept that aggressiveness you know with mixing and i'm starting to actually bring some of that back again because i feel sometimes uh it's missing like sometimes and I'm actually having fun but now nowadays you have to edit your records because everything's freaking digital mm -hmm. but I'll edit versions that are only a minute and a half wow. where I like yo that's that song kicks in I got 30 seconds before I start mixing mm -hmm. my next record or it's just going to beats yeah. and you're fucked yeah. so you got to be aggressive yeah so I've actually been starting to bring some of that back in finding the balance because sitting there and playing 30 songs in in a half hour it could be a little overwhelming for people mm -hmm. these days. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> like, what yeah, the hell's on going the on? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then you got, uh, you know, as much as you've been DJing, you've been producing, you know, the whole time and remixing. Yeah. And, yeah. and you're, I mean, we don't have enough time to read your list of credits as a remixer, but, you know, everyone from Madonna to Lady Gaga to the killers, right? Yeah. And, I've been I've been very I've been very fortunate with uh with my remix career and and part of that is I I would say well my friends say every five to six years I reinvent myself and come up with a different sound and 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 lock in because I I don't ever feel that you should stay on one thing uh, at least for myself uh, but more recently the most exciting thing I've done. Uh, and you're going to be talking to him in a second is wild style because yeah. that's it's the first time that I think uh, at least in or one of the, one of the few times where I feel like I'm doing something that nobody has done in a long time. And that's very rare to be in the studio and go, wow, oh, who else is doing this? nobody all right let's go <laughs> you know it's very it's very rare yeah. to have that to have mm -hmm. you know and that's and that was just something that came from two years ago i was just in the studio and i was like if i do another four on the floor song right now i'm gonna shoot myself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and 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 thankfully for youtube i was just like just as a joke I put on Planet Rock, mm -hmm. and I went, ah, how about if I make the kick bounce like that? And I was like, ah, this is cool. Oh, but there's a slower. I'm doing it at 125. I'm like, ah, this is cool. And all of a sudden, I see the cover girls. I see it, and I spent four hours just listening to freestyle records, yeah. and it just hit me like nobody's done this. Nobody's mm -hmm. brought it back with a different take on things, and it's the most excite like, to be in the studio going, wow, we're on to something mm -hmm. that, that could be real special or it could be like nobody gets it. But sure. I was like, I could see I could see the signs. I could see the signs in dance music that everything was going funky, mm -hmm. funky, funky. And actually, we're supposed to, this record was done almost two years ago. And we just felt that it was too ahead. We had to wait and wait mm -hmm. and wait for the right time because... EDM was peaking at rate and people would be like, what the hell is this? So we, we sat on it for a little while and, and we actually, uh, we, we, we recorded almost a whole album. We recorded yeah. another mm -hmm. 10 to 12 songs. Nice. Um, and it's just been really exciting. Um, and then we found really good people to work with, with Sonia and Frankie mm -hmm. and, and them, you know, it, it's one thing to, to, 
make a piece of music. And a piece of music can only be a piece of music, but to watch uh, Wild Style bring it to life is mm-hmm. amazing. To watch, to watch, to go to these high schools and watch the girls <laughs> perform and watch, you know, a 16-year-old, you know, girl come up to them and go, oh my God, you guys are the best thing in the whole wide world. It's it's amazing. It's that's like, cool. you know, they bring the music to life. Mm-hmm. And that's been even, that's also the other side of it that's exciting because it's one thing you produce a song and you give it to somebody but it's one thing to see them bringing it to life right. is is has been pretty amazing yeah so talk about that a little bit and i'm excited to to meet the girls and hear their side of the story but yeah so uh, it's completely opposite of course <laughs> yeah but you know it is interesting right and in, you know typically you're making beats and you're sending them off you know you've you've done all these remixes Presumably, most of the time, the artist wasn't in the room. No, never. Um, and so, now taking the role of developing an artist, right, and, yeah. and thinking not just about the song, which obviously is important, right, about the artist and and all that. And so, how does that, how does that change your process? Um, it it makes the process. Uh, it's a lot more work. Mm-hmm. But it's more, I would say, more uh, gratifying. Mm-hmm. Um, the music process doesn't change. Right. Um, but to develop an artist, um, that's a new challenge. And you learn. You yeah. learn every, like I'm learning every day with this process. Things that work, that don't work. Um, and it's been, the development part has been really cool because we've been very fortunate uh to surround ourselves with some really cool people Mm -hmm. you know i never knew how difficult it was to sing and dance Mm -hmm. like it never occurred to me it's the hardest thing in the world and then my one boy was like that's why nobody does it live everybody lip syncs and you're like what do you mean everybody michael jackson everybody that was all lip syncing you're like really like they're not doing it. Oh sure. yeah, it's completely. So to watch, because we're like, yo, we want the girls to be the real thing. So to watch them go from trying to sing live and dance the very first time, and you're you're, you're actually sitting there going, oh my god, this is a train wreck. This is never gonna happen. Like, because you don't realize how hard it is. You yeah. don't realize the first time, <laughs> and then you'll see you'll come back to two rehearsals later, and you'll be like oh my God, they improved 100%. And you go like four and you just start to see the process and you start to see it go from like, because I've never been at the beginning stage. Mm -hmm. I don't understand seeing Mm -hmm. an artist trying to sing and dance for the first time. Mm -hmm. Like, it's almost like telling a producer who's never produced, all right, here's the drums, here's this. The first beat he's going to do that first day, you're going to be like, oh, okay. But he's going to keep on, if he keeps on doing it every day, yeah. a month later, you're going to be like, oh, that beat's pretty dope. Mm-hmm. And to see that, and to see that development from the girls and watch them just grow as artists and really sing and dance, and then hear other people go, oh my God, your girls are really singing and dancing, holy shit. And you're sitting there going, yeah, what the fuck did you think we're doing? <laughs> you know, acting all confident, like, yeah, motherfucker, that's how I roll. Like, literally the first day you're going, oh my God, I'm in shit creek, what the fuck did I do? Yeah. yeah. Like, you just don't know. So it, it's been cool, and then we've had really good people that have, you know, have helped the girls, you know, find their niche. Like, really good live mm-hmm. people, really good uh, live choreographers and then the girls themselves just you know giving a hundred percent when they think they can't do what yeah. they're at being asked to do and watch them and then watch them come up with their own ideas and it's you know that part has been been awesome to see because that's something I've never seen in my mm-hmm. whole career and I've been yeah, around for awesome. a long time mm-hmm. so all of a sudden this process gets me excited every day yeah. because I'm seeing something brand new i'm doing something brand new (laughs) and when you're in the music business i can sit there and be like ah okay i'm gonna remix another record i'm gonna remix this record it it's exciting but it's not exciting Mm -hmm. because i'm not learning anything new i'm Mm -hmm. just you know gonna put my take on that record yeah um but watching an artist you know start from zero and grow that's been really exciting Mm -hmm. you know and and so did you remember when when you're you know you're looking at that first performance and going oh shit like did you remember 
that when you started out, you weren't very good? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, there are certain things. I, there are certain <laughs> things that we knew that was going to be, yeah. you know, that you just have to get on stage. So what we did, because we knew we were going to have some of those things, yeah. uh, we booked them up at clubs kind of on the down low. Like, yeah. yo, just get them. They have to get yeah. on stage and get yeah. them experience. They just yeah. have to get up and do it. There's as much as you could tell somebody, hey, this is what you're going to do in your DJ set. When you get on stage, you're you're, mm -hmm. you're yeah. shaky. As mm -hmm. much as you practice, you're, oh, I got this. Yeah. It just becomes a whole different yeah, feel. Right. So, yeah. yeah, we gave them some room to 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 get experience. Mm -hmm. And um, and the girls have been doing amazing i mean they've been in front of like eight thousand people now yeah, so they know how it is to be in front of eight thousand people and to be in front of 200 people and it, it's just like anything else it's just a matter of doing over and over again yeah. mm -hmm. so helping them um helping them win in those situations mm -hmm. and it's not even no not necessary it's just helping putting the team around them yeah because yeah. i can't sit there and say yo uh, think up as right. as homeboy would always say when they sing and I learn from them you know it, it's it's amazing like because you've, you've never been around it mm -hmm. so yeah it's exciting it's exciting every day yeah that's awesome yeah. no that's cool I mean I think you know there's a couple myths around music that are really damaging right and one is that it's you know this idea of the overnight success no yeah you know this idea that um, that you are alone right like that that you're the you know that the star is doing it all by themselves right right and those those things obviously are not true right. as you're no, saying no and, no no i mean somebody said something the other day and it was it was right on it says it takes a village to break an artist yeah yeah, yeah you gotta have a big team around mm -hmm. you yeah you know so who, so let's talk about that a little bit before we uh get in with the girls who've been some mentors that have been important to you and what have they taught you? Uh, you know what? One mentor is our good friend, Dennis. He's been a really good mentor, Static Revenger, A.K. Latroy, <laughs> A.K. what he's going to call himself <laughs> next year. Maybe he should just call himself A.K.A. <laughs> <laughs> That's not bad. That might be taken. Uh, he's, been, he's been like a really good mentor that I can call every day and we kind of mentor each other yeah. in a way because there's certain aspects of the music business i may have more knowledge on right and there's certain aspects that he has more knowledge on yeah and he's been probably my biggest sounding board over every year like almost every major decision that i make i run past him mm -hmm. and there are certain things that would be like i'm gonna call him up and he's gonna say yo that's the right answer i already have the right answer he's like are you an idiot yeah. You know, this is what you need to do. It's blah 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 blah. I'm like, oh my god, I never, I never saw that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and is that just because you can't, you can't see it for yourself? No, there's just you just think certain things. You just think this is the right answer, mm -hmm. and you need that sounding board of sometimes like, no, that's not the right answer. Right. This is the right answer. You should go in this direction. Yeah. And uh, it's always good to have you know, good feedback. And mm -hmm. and he's also a good mentor in a way of we send each other music and like, yo, what mm. do you think of this? Hey, change this and this, or this is right on, don't touch it. Um, he's been a really good mentor. And I had another one in the radio business, uh, Rick Cummings, who is the president of MS yeah. now. Um, and MS Broadcasting owns Power 106 and Hot 97 in New York. And he was the one, um, when I started mixing on Power, he came in, they blew out the whole um, music staff, and he came in from Indianapolis, not knowing anything about LA or LA radio, and I watched this guy just rebuild it, and, and, and the station had really dropped off and fell off the map on the ratings, and he rebuilt it. And just watching somebody that didn't have the answers figure out the mm -hmm. answers. Mm. And he told me one time, he goes, eh, and I and I and I said like you really don't know anything about like dance music or hip hop, but he's like, you're only as good as the people you surround yourself with. Yeah. And he surrounded himself with really good people that he really believed in, and took all their input and picked out the best of the best. And he's been you know a really good mentor in that way. As in, he's the first person that will admit when he does something wrong. Like mm -hmm. oh, 
that shit was wrong. You know, he took off all the mix shows off power for two weeks. Right. All of them. And said, I don't even know if we need this. And I'm sitting there going, oh, my God, this guy's a complete idiot. And then two weeks later, he goes, all right, that was a big mistake. Let's put this on. Let's put this on. But we're going to hold off on this. And he was the one that discovered the Baker Boys, mm -hmm. gave them their shot. They became stars. Big Boy was a security guard walking in the hallways yeah. that he thought was funny and gave him a shot. Like he saw talent. He gave me a shot with power tools. I came to him and said, hey, I think we should do this all house and techno show. And he said, great, let's do it. And I said, "Who? who's going to host it? And I said, let's get like the boomer or somebody. And he's like, no, what, does the boomer know techno? And I said, no, they, well, you talk about it. I was like, I don't talk on the radio. It's going to sound horrible. <laughs> he's like, well, if you know about it, then you should talk about it. Right. And I did the first show for Power Tools, and I came in with, you know, so we can listen to the breaks, thinking he, like, I knew it sounded horrible. My friends thought it sounded horrible. I wanted somebody else to host it. Mm -hmm. And he listened to it. He goes, all right, it'll get better. And I sat there and I said, are you crazy? That's terrible. He goes, it's your first time on radio. What do you expect? Don't yeah. worry. Give it two or three months. And he was he was right. He oh, knew, he awesome. he was able to see the talent in people a year from now. Mm -hmm. And that's how he saw Big Boy and that's how he saw the Baker Boys and you know and that's how he he saw time and brought in people like Jimmy Steele mm -hmm. to program the station and I was like this guy's from Texas and this is when hip hop was at its highest peak and I'm like he's bringing in somebody from Texas to program a hip hop station. That's I don't know if that's going to work. And Jimmy took it to the highest level that power had ever been at that time. Yeah. Um, so that's why he's a mentor. Yeah. He can, he could see things kind of in the future. And I've learned to like, you know, you got to be able to see things a year from now. Mm -hmm. So even though when I, you know, we, we, we put wild style together, even though I was like, Oh my God, but I knew we keep on doing this. We mm -hmm. keep on doing this. You got to stay in the future. It's not yeah. about what's what's going to be in that day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's about the potential. Yeah, where are they going to be six right. months from now? Where are they going to be a year from now? Right. And it's potentially are they stars? Potentially, you know, once everything gets going, are they going to ride like the way he saw them Baker Boys and the way he saw them Big Boy? Mm -hmm. That's the same way you got to look at an artist. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was fun. I hope you enjoyed it. I really liked hearing old school stories from Richard Vision. Next week, we're going to get into talking with his new group, Wild Style. You'll hear, hear from the girls directly. Until then, leave us a comment. Post uh, a photo of yourself listening to the podcast. I don't know. Do something. Peace. We'll talk to you next week. <laughs>